AM 620 WSUN. Entertaining talk radio for the 90s. It's time for Lassiter. You can talk to the Mad Dog in Hillsboro at 221-WSUN. In Pinellas, 576-WSUN. All other areas, 1-800-356-WSUN. The opinions expressed are not necessarily those of the advertisers, staff, or management of AM 620 WSUN. Entertaining talk radio for the 90s. After the hour of 2 o'clock Friday, December the 23rd, 1994. And tomorrow is Christmas Eve, and the day after that is Christmas. So another Christmas has snuck up on us. You know, they have a habit of doing that. I'm not really sure how it happened, but this is going to be my 50th, 50th Christmas. I don't know how that's possible. I honestly and truly don't know how that's possible. And at my place, it's going to be a very, very special Christmas. It'll be our first in the new house. And that means an awful lot to us. The Muff has done an unbelievable job of turning it into a, a wonderland. Now, every year I manage to pronounce the tree the best ever, and the food, and the decorations, and all the other trappings the best ever. And this year is no exception, except maybe this year, they really will be the best ever. Somehow we've managed to get almost everything done. We sweat it every year. There never seems to be enough time or energy. Some years there isn't enough money. But somehow it all gets done. There's still a few things to do. One more trip to the grocery store. And, of course, that potato salad still has to be made. Just found that Polish ham in the nick of time. Thought we were going to have to do without it this year. It's important at my house. It's, it's a traditional kind of thing. Tradition's very important. And in just about 24 hours from now, the real fun begins. We're doing something a little bit different this year. I'm cooking the Christmas Day dinner. It's kind of a gift to the Muffy, you know? And an effort to take some of the pressure off of her. She does most of the hard work. It's the least I can do. You know, a lot of people say that Christmas is too commercialized. I'm not sure that I understand that. And I really don't agree. I don't even come close to agreeing. You see, Christmas is what you want it to be. And, and Christmas is it's what you make it. And if you let somebody else dictate the terms and the conditions of your Christmas, then I, I guess it could be too gaudy. I guess it could be too commercialized. But you see, if you take charge, if you make it what you want it to be, then nobody else can spoil it. Okay, so they do seem to start putting out the Christmas stuff earlier and earlier and earlier in the stores every year in the malls, but so what? Christmas isn't trees and trains and holly and candy canes. Christmas is a spirit. It's a feeling that resides deep, deep, deep down inside your heart, inside your soul. And nobody can tell you when to get it, nor can they tell, tell you not to get it. They, they can't keep it from you. Sometimes, some years, it comes on slowly. Other years, God, it comes on like gangbusters. There really isn't any explaining why. I was just in the mall. It was decorated to beat the band, man, but... Had there been no sign of the holiday at all, it wouldn't diminish my spirit. How very sad it is to hear somebody say, Ah, oh, Christmas is for kids. You know, like that's some kind of a, a big, profound statement. Oh, stop the presses, man. Christmas is for kids. Hey, of course it is. It always has been. It always will be. It should be. But you see, Christmas, Christmas is a chance for everyone to be a kid again. One day, one week, one season to giggle and to be full of anticipation. You know, adults are too damn wrapped up in their own importance to appreciate twinkling lights and presents wrapped up with ribbons and bows. A lot of adults think that being a kid again is somehow beneath their dignity. They think that it's immature. They think, I don't know what the hell they think. It's all hogwash. Maybe the problem is that too many adults are too involved in acquiring things, you know? I mean, how can you get excited about Christmas when you don't fully understand what it's all about? 
Because Christmas isn't about acquiring. It's not about getting. Christmas is about giving. I mean, when was the last time you saw some guy who spends every other day of the year trying to get more and more and more squeal with absolute delight as his present was accepted and opened by the recipient? And maybe that's what's wrong. It kills some people to give. But that's what Christmas is all about. Adults just don't ever seem to be able to make the effort to do the things that are important for Christmas. Like taking the time to listen for the sleigh bells. So they never hear them. They never hear the prancing of little hooves on the roof. <sighs> How sad. And they never communicate with Santa Claus. They never write to him. They never call him. They never talk to him. <sighs> we do at my house all the time. No, I'm serious. Mary talked to him just the other night. Now she was trying to square it for me, you know. Telling Santa that I wasn't really all that bad. I forget what I had done, but I had done something to jeopardize Christmas. And she just picked up the phone, and she called the North Pole, and she said, Could I talk to Santa Claus? And he was on the other end of the phone, and she was asking him to give me another chance this year. I just happened to walk into the room while it was all going on. God, I hope it all works out. Adults just never seem to, to break out into a chorus of jingle bells where Santa Claus is coming to town. <sighs> but they should. We do around my house all the time. I'm not ashamed to tell you that. Adults think that Christmas is a, oh, I don't know, a lot of trouble and a lot of expense and, oh, that it's all just over too soon. We know only people who are out of touch with reality would say something like that. But then when was, when was the last time you ran into an adult who was really in touch with reality? Adults don't swipe licks from a newly frosted cake. Adults don't scuff their shoes while playing with a new toy on the floor. Adults never get grass stains from romping in the backyard. Adults never seem to find the time to think thoughts like these. Too bad. Because these are the thoughts that reality is made of. Some of us are lucky enough to be able to return to the real world for at least a few days a year, right around Christmas time. The rest of the year? Well, that's another story. Let me take you home with me for Christmas this year. Let me introduce you around, share the bounty, celebrate the holidays. All of them. My first Christmas? It's nothing more than a photograph, a child not yet three months old, seated in a high chair in front of a Christmas tree. But it must have been a very, very special Christmas. Because it was the first in many years without a war. It was the Christmas of 1945. So many lives have, had been put on hold for so very long. And at last it was over. And it was Christmas time. And the boys were coming home and families were getting back together. In all honesty, I can't really remember too much about it. In all honesty, I can't really remember much about Christmas until that magical one. When I was four, it was 1949. But oh, what a Christmas it was. It set the tone for all of the other Christmases to come, even for this one. I was only a child, of course. And of course, I was the only child. And the first grandchild. And the war was now just a memory and things were getting back to normal. The adults were trying to pick up where they had left off. The future was bright. And that Christmas, well, it really started on Thanksgiving Day. I remember we were at my grandmother's house. Gigantic, beautiful house. And there was a great big bird in the oven, and the table had been set with the finest china and linen that my grandmother owned. And in the living room stood a box, a magic box, that brought pictures into the house from far-off places. It was the first year that my family was able to sit in the comfort of their living room and watch the Gimbel's Department Store Thanksgiving Day Parade on television. At some point, I'm not really clear, clear where, they called me into the room for the big event. <sighs> wow, an event that was beyond my wildest imagination. We're talking about the arrival in Philadelphia of a man who had come to be my best friend, Santa Claus. They told me all about him. They told me, they told me about how he... How he came down from his home in the North Pole every year. And how he went from house to house on Christmas Eve delivering toys to good little boys and girls. I was astonished. They said he had a sleigh and magic reindeer that could fly. My grandmother promised to take me over to Philadelphia and introduce me personally to Santa Claus the very next week. But before that happened, I actually had a close encounter with him. 
right in my very own house. It's 16 minutes after the hour of 2 o'clock. The day after Thanksgiving, I was at home, 128 Maple Avenue in Woodland, New Jersey, a small town right outside of Camden, which is right outside of Philadelphia. It was a strange town. It was one of those towns that was built by a factory during the First World War for people who worked at the factory to live in. The factory was long gone, but the houses remained, and it was home. It was a two-bedroom, one-bath, red row house, red brick row house. It was in the early afternoon. I was helping my mother. We were in the upstairs bedroom, and she was ironing. And helping meant doing things like handing her the next shirt or whatever. Doing whatever she asked me to do. And I spent a lot of time with my mother. And we were talking. We were talking about what had happened the day before over at my grandmother's. Talking about that parade. Talking about that man that I was going to go meet the following week. And as we were talking, at some point, my mother said, Shh. Did you hear that? And I, I didn't hear it. Oh, never mind. And we talked some more, and I helped her some more, and she said, Shh, did you, did you hear that? And I said, what? And she said, the jingle bells. Did you hear the jingle bells? And I, I listened, but, but I didn't hear them. And we talked a little bit more, and again she said, Shh, listen. And I said, what? And she said, I think I hear reindeer hooves up on the roof and jingle bells. And I listened real, real close. And I, I think I could hear it, too. I, I wasn't quite sure, but I think I could hear it, too. And she said, let's go downstairs. Let's, let's check this out. And so we went downstairs. And sure enough, on the mantel... In the living room, someone had hung a stocking with my name on it. And my mother said, I thought I heard him. And I said, who? And she said, Santa Claus. Oh, my God. He was actually right there in the house, and I missed him. And she said, shh, shh, listen, listen. Hear the, hear the sleigh bells? And I did. I did hear them. As Santa got back in his sleigh and went off to the next house to hang yet another stocking. A few days later, I would actually meet Santa Claus face to face. Early that morning, my mother got me up and dressed. She put me in my best corduroy pants and my best shirt. And gave me a new sweater that I had never seen before. A sweater with reindeer all over it. As I was getting dressed, my mother was talking to me again. She, she was talking to me about Santa Claus. She seemed to know an awful lot about the jolly old elf, things uh, like his favorite foods, cookies and milk, the names of his reindeer, where he lived and worked. She told me all about the elves and the fact that Santa Claus was a world-class toy maker. A very special thing happened that morning. I got to go in the car with my father as he drove over to pick up his father and dropped me off at my grandmother's. My grandmother had a big breakfast ready for me, and after we cleaned up, we walked up Morton Street to Liberty, and we caught a bus for Philadelphia. Shortly, we were in downtown Philadelphia. Oh, my God, what a wonderland. There were trees full of lights and store windows with animated figures, and there was holly and ribbons and, and organ grinders and the smell of chestnuts roasting. And everywhere there was music, special music, Christmas music. The music that would become a tradition and more. We went inside Lit Brothers' department store, up to the fifth floor. An entire village, an entire life-size village took up the entire fifth floor. Depicting colonial Philadelphia 
with figures, life-size figures that moved and sang and danced. An entire floor devoted to Christmas. Can you imagine that today? Can you imagine a department store knocking out an entire floor to put in a Christmas village? Not one counter, not one kiosk, just a display. And then it happened. My eyes were full of wonder. At every turn were things that I had never seen before in my life. Sights and sounds and smells. Each step brought the unexpected and then the most unexpected of all. We got into a line. A long line that seemed to move ever, ever so slowly. And then before I realized it, I was at the head of that line. And before me sat none other than Santa Claus himself. Finally, he beckoned to me, called me by name, Bobby. I went over. He lifted me up off my feet effortlessly as though I, I, as though I were a feather. Sat me down on his knee, and he started to talk to me. He seemed to know so much about me, he inquired as to if I was still helping my mother around the house and if I was still trying to be a good boy. And then he asked what I wanted him to bring me for Christmas. Well, I had prepared for this day. Oh, I had my list. I have no recollection of what I asked for. But I can still see him considering each and every request. Finally, he said that he'd see what he could do. And he bid me farewell. Said that he'd see me on Christmas Eve. At some point, I don't know when. I never did notice. A picture was taken. I still have the picture. It sits in my office every day of the year. Me, my best buddy, Santa Claus, and my finest corduroy pants, my newest shirt, and that reindeer sweater. It's a day I will never forget. It's the day that a lifelong friendship began, one that lasts to this very day. My new best friend, Santa Claus, kept his word. He stopped by to see me on Christmas Eve. Oh, my God, did he stop by and see me. It's 227. ever get there. I couldn't understand why why it took so long. But finally, it arrived. I'd been instructed to go to bed early one night and warned that should I wake up before my parents did, that under no circumstances, under no conditions, was I to go downstairs alone the next morning. Of course, I awoke for first, and of course, I, I obeyed. I was a good kid. Well, I kind of obeyed. No one said that I couldn't lay down on the top step and, you know, kind of stretch my little body out there and peek downstairs. And what I saw still stands out of my memory. It was unbelievable. First over in the corner was a gigantic tree with lights and tinsel and colored balls and God only knows what else. And under that, a miniature village and a train set and an entire living room full of toys. I do not exaggerate. A living room full of toys with only a small path to get through it to the dining room. There was a gas station, a Texaco gas station, just like the one up on the corner. And there were stuffed animals and games and toys and, and some musical instruments. The drums caught my eye. I just couldn't take my eyes off of this bounty. I was frozen in place. I was frozen in time. I don't know how long I laid there. I don't know how long it took before my parents finally woke up. And together, the three of us went downstairs. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Later that day at dinner, the most unusual thing happened. The drum set disappeared. Hasn't been seen to this day. No one has 
there's an explanation for it, but it was there in the living room, in amongst all those other toys, and, and we left the room and went out into the dining room to have dinner, and after dinner I went back into the living room to play with my toys, and the drum set was gone. My mother said something about Santa Claus had left it there by mistake, that it was really not for another little boy named Michael or Tommy or something like that in another town, and that's probably what had happened. And He was very, very, very uh, sorry for the mistake. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people don't believe in Santa Claus. Can you imagine that, especially after the story I just told you? I don't understand people that don't believe in Santa Claus. I mean, Santa Claus is as real as real can be. I know it, and I can prove it. For one thing, I've known him now for going on 50 years, and he has never let me down, ever. There were some good years, there were some bad but he never let me down. Ever. And besides, I've got that picture of him. Of him and me. Well, that proves it, doesn't it? And besides, my mother is the one who told me all about Santa Claus, and she wouldn't fib. So there. What more do you need? As for the people who say that Santa Claus isn't really real, well, they just don't know what they're talking about. I guess some people think that he doesn't exist because they misunderstand, you know? They think that Santa brings all of the presents. Well, he doesn't. In fact, sometimes he doesn't bring any. If there are others who are more deserving of his help, or if you haven't been as good as you should have been all year long. And sometimes we get confused, you know, with so many Santa Claus lookalikes. Who are basically well-meaning people just trying to help out. But you'll know the real Santa Claus when you see him. Don't worry about that. And then there's all that talk about Santa Claus, you know, that he's on computer bulletin boards or that he has email or that he, he flies in helicopters now instead of using his sleigh. I, I don't listen to that stuff. I mean, here's the real scoop, okay? Santa Claus lives at the North Pole. He has a sleigh and reindeer, period, end of the story. I know that because that's what my mom said. And I cannot begin to imagine her being wrong about something so important. Remember, she even told me what his favorite food is. She knows everything about him. And if he wasn't real, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe the real confusion comes from misunderstanding of just what Santa Claus does, okay? Well, first and foremost, he listens to dreams. And secondly, he helps us all to be good. And thirdly, he fills our hearts with hope and with joy. He's been doing it for years, as no one else on the face of this earth can. So there, you see, that proves it. Make no mistake about it, he and the elves are indeed top-notch toy makers, and they have been almost, well, forever. And he does indeed show up all over the world every single Christmas, delivering dreams to children of all ages. That's a fact, an undeniable fact that nobody can disprove. Will all the toys under your tree this year be from Santa? I can't say for sure. But if you don't believe, really believe, then why should he leave anything for you at all? Now, some people th say that it's, it's silly to believe in him because you'll still probably get lots of presents anyway. Well, maybe. But what you won't get is the joy. It's not quite the same if you... You don't believe that Santa is behind it all. Believing in Santa Claus is very, very easy when you're young. As you get older, well, it just doesn't come as easy. I admit that I didn't always believe. And I admit that it doesn't always make sense. You know that a, a fat man and his elves would go to all, all that trouble. And, you know, you can raise the questions about the expense. I mean, where does the money come for all of this stuff? And then there are, you know, the problems of, you know, there isn't snow every place uh, for that sleigh uh, to land. And, and, you know, there's not enough time and too many houses and too many boys and girls. And how can all of that stuff fit in a sack? Well, I can't explain exactly how it's done. I'm not saying a clause. It just gets done. That's all. And the fact of the matter is, is, is that you're not required to believe in Santa Claus. And nobody can make you believe. And you don't have to. Santa won't take away your toys. 
And he's not going to put coal in your stocking. He doesn't do that kind of stuff. He'll understand. Of course, his feelings will be hurt. But he'll understand. He knows how hard it is to believe with so many people trying to convince you that he's just a myth. Santa never expected anything in return from you, and he still doesn't. So he won't get mad. Maybe just a little bit sad. You see, Santa isn't really about toys and trees and presents and pretty lights and ribbons and bows. He's about hope and innocence and caring and joy. And I guess that's something that that's just hard to believe in these days. But do you know the best thing about Santa Claus? You can always go back. You can always pick up where you left off and begin believing again. Hey, look at me. I'm a 49-year-old man. I believe. I didn't always, but I sure do now. And I'm glad of it. I'm proud of it. I don't mind saying it. Right here on the radio. I mean, if there was no Santa Claus, how is it that a grown man who doesn't believe in anything else could believe in him? Go on, answer that if you can. But I didn't come here to defend Santa Claus. I came here to take you home with me for Christmas. Home is Philadelphia and the surrounding towns. Now, if you close your eyes... You can see that there's just a hint of snow in the air. Oh, okay, it's more of a hope than a hint. The streets are filled with holiday shoppers and chestnut vendors and carolers and even organ grinders. I can still see and hear and smell all of it. It's been closed for years now, but in my mind, the fifth floor of Lit Brothers Department Store is still a colonial village. The atrium at Wanamaker's is still full of music from that pipe organ. In my mind, it's all as real today as it was way, way back then. It's real because it's Christmas, man. It's my Christmas. And while mine is unique to me, and yours is unique to you, there's a lot that we have in common. Oh, yeah, and then there are the people. They're part of it as well. The very important part of it. You've got to meet them. The years, I'm sorry to say, have not been kind to me and my family. Many of them are long gone. And the others, I haven't seen or spoken to for many years. But today, they're all here. They're all as real as real can be. We get together each and every Christmas. Each and every one of us. And we always will. So long as there is breath in my body on this day of the year. There's my mom, prettiest mom in the world, isn't she? And my dad, the most handsome dad in the world. And there's Grandma and Jaji, and my dad's sister, Aunt Irene. And there's Grandpa Welsh. He spent all of his time and all of his energy trying to encourage people to keep Christ in Christmas. You know, I can't ever remember getting a toy from him, ever. But that's okay. He was Grandpa, and I loved him. And there's Aunt Kate, my mother's oldest sister, an absolute meticulous housekeeper. But that's the strange thing. Nobody ever saw her clean. She's a great cook. No one ever saw her eat. She drinks, you know. That's part of the problem. And there's her husband, Uncle Franny, an absolute pillar of strength. What a man is supposed to be. A good provider, a good husband, a good dad. And the children. Eileen, she's the oldest. She's two years younger than me. Please try not to stare at the birthmark on her cheek. There's Michael, the one that looks like an angel. Ha! Huh. In a few years, he'll be in jail for burning his house down. And Richard, he's a roofer now. And Jenny, I think he's still in the service. And there's young Rosemary. Pretty, isn't she? A little later on, Aunt Marie and Uncle Joe will come by. Aunt Marie is my mother's younger sister. And Uncle Joe is Uncle Franny's younger brother. Aunt Marie is loud and boisterous. Screams a lot. But she's got a heart of gold. Don't be put off by her. Uncle Joe? Well, oh, he drinks too. But he's a nice man. He's a good man. Hard worker. He's a bricklayer. 
And there are children. There's little Joey and Gary. Gary's the slow one. And Tommy and little Patty. Uncle Jack isn't here. Uncle Jack is the youngest brother of the three sisters. He's in the Navy. He's married to Aunt Billy. Their children, Kathy and little Jackie, and the baby, Rebecca. They don't get home for Christmas very much. Christmas is so many things. It's people and tastes and sounds and memories. So very, very many memories. <laughs> like the mailman coming to the house, loaded down with Christmas cards and letters and greetings, not once, but three or four times a day. I'm not kidding. Three or four times a day. For weeks. People used to send a lot more cards. I'm not really sure that it's because people liked you better or something like that. They also used to keep lists of who sent them cards. And if they, if they didn't get a card from you for a year or two, bam, you're off of their list. And then there are those special dishes filled with cookies and nuts and candies. And I still have most of them. They're wrapped in newspaper and carefully stored away out in the garage now since we don't live like that anymore. But I will never, ever, ever be able to part with them. From time to time, I carefully unwrap, but unwrap them and sit there and look at them. Each one had its very own use, and I can still remember exactly what went in each. And then there was the birthday cake. Yes, the birthday cake. Well, I mean, come on, what, what is Christmas, huh? Yes, it's... It's Christ's birthday. And how can, you have a, how can you celebrate a birthday without a birthday cake? So my mother made a birthday cake for him every year. Big double-layer chocolate cake with white icing on it. My father made a little manger, and they found a little, a little doll. And then there are those plastic candles in the window. <laughs> that probably didn't cost more than 2 or $3 dollars. There were two sets of them, one for each front window. It's silly how some things say something to you. I, I, they meant Christmas to me, man. It was my job to plug them in every evening. And then there was something that you may find very strange, out of, out of place for a Christmas memory. A lady shook electric razor. I only saw it twice. Christmas of 1957 and again in 1983. I'll tell you more about that later. It's 245. were still married, Christmas Eve was spent at my grandmother's house, 928 Morton Street in Camden, New Jersey, a big yellow brick, well, I'm not sure if it was a row house or a townhouse, it was something in between, I guess, it was way too big to be a row house, and, well, maybe they didn't make townhouses out of yellow bricks. It was the home of Sophie and Charlie Gwodowski, an unusually comfortable and somewhat pretentious home for a paper hanger and a seamstress. Charlie was a quiet man came to this country at the beginning of the century as a tourist. He owned five suits when he came here. Had a full head of hair and both his legs. He's down to two suits now. As you can see, the hair is all gone. And he lost a leg in the mid-1940s. Came from years and years and years, they told him, of leaning against the ladder in just such a way that he caused bone cancer. They took his leg halfway up the hip. And Sophie? Gargantuan woman, isn't she? Those pockmarks on her face come from 
childhood disease. But her heart's as good as gold. She's a great cook. Good housekeeper, too. Christmas Eve was a blur of activity at their house. All kinds of last-minute preparations, the wrapping of gifts, the massive spread of food that had to be consumed by 6 o'clock so that the family could attend midnight mass. You couldn't eat after 6 o'clock and receive communion. I don't know why, but that's what the rule was. The menu was the same year after year after year and was centered around a giant Polish ham and an equally large bowl of potato salad. <laughs> a simple meal. The table was set with the best china and a lace tablecloth, silver serving pieces for what amounts to cold cuts. The potato salad, <laughs> just some potatoes, mayonnaise, a little bit of onion, a little bit of celery. That's all. On the buffet, there were numerous silver-plated trays that held a variety of baked goods, all homemade, all from recipes carried from the old country. Endless days of preparation went into the making of those treats. And a boy was permitted to sample as many as he pleased for himself, thank you. After all, this was Christmas. I've long since forgotten the names of most of the delicacies. Oh, one was called Khrushchikis and... <sighs> Can't really remember the others. But I'll never, ever, ever forget how good they looked and tasted. The powdered sugar, the, the fillings. Throughout the evening, friends and neighbors would come to call, perhaps dropping off a gift or two, always leaving with mounds and mounds of food. You see, food was love at my grandmother's house. Christmas Day in the early years was spent at the house at 128 Maple Avenue with a traditional turkey dinner and the stuffing and the mashed potatoes and the corn and the cranberry sauce, sauce and, of course, there was the birthday cake for dessert. The living room was rearranged to accommodate a large tree and a train platform. And every year, everywhere you looked, there were toys. There are indeed benefits, by the way, to being the only child and the first grandchild and the first child born to your parents' circle of friends and co-workers. Many, many benefits. And most of them can be measured in toys. My mother, she was a telephone operator. And a woman who loved children, a woman who loved Christmas. My father was a machinist by day and a part-time accordion player in Walt Podusik's band. Every year, my dad would spend hours erecting a miniature village surrounded by a train set. In no other endeavor did he ever demonstrate so much patience and artistic ability. The roads were all real gravel. Even the telephone poles were strung with cotton thread. And of course, each year saw new additions. And even let me operate the locomotive from the very first year. Christmas morning was always the same. I was always the first to wake up, and I would take my position at the top of the steps, gazing down at the wonder below until given the okay to go down. The first stop was always the dining room table, where there was proof positive of Santa's visit in the pre-dawn hours. It came in the form of an empty glass of milk and cookie crumbs, along with a note that my mother would read to me. The note would either explain something or just say Merry Christmas. I'll see you again next year, love, Santa Claus. It should come as no real surprise that I was not exactly like all of the other kids. I mean, how the hell do you think I got to be like this, you know? I've always been a bit different. The last year we were all together, I understood that Santa had other boys and girls to look after and that he had turned over most of the gift-giving to my parents. My parents were hardworking people who needed a little bit of help and a little bit of guidance. So when I presented them my list of Christmas wishes, it was in right, proper form and order, I'll have you know. There was the item listed, followed by the price, followed by where it could be purchased, or if it came from a catalog, the page number and the catalog number. We made it as easy for them as we possibly could. And that's what Christmas was like while we were together. We weren't always together. Only the first seven years, when I was eight, things changed dramatically. 
things change drastically. I'll tell you about that in a moment. It's 2.56. I can't tell you very much about Christmas that year, except that it was unsettling. I have no recollection of presents received, nor any other details save for one. It started off like any other holiday that I had known to that point in my life. The day came for the annual trip to Philadelphia with my grandmother and my visit with Santa Claus. I'm sure that I had given it a great deal of thought, you know, as to what I would ask for. A boy had to be careful about such things. I mean, Santa and I had become best of buddies, but... His time was limited, and there was no room for error. I'm sure that I was just as thrilled as in previous years with all of the wonder and the splendor of the season. The sights and sounds, even the aromas of downtown Philadelphia. The extravagant Christmas displays. That animated colonial village that took up the entire fifth floor at Litz. The living Christmas tree and the pipe organ at John Wanamaker's, another department store. A whole year had gone by since I had last experienced these marvelous things, but how could I not be impressed? But before the day would end, Christmas would change forever. There was so much to see and do on a day like this. Oh, there was Uncle Whip's toy store in Wanamaker's, a toy store filled with four and five hundred and, and even a thousand dollar toys. And this is the early 1950s. I mean, Ike was president, for God's sake. And there were the carolers on virtually every street corner. And the special lunch that my grandmother and I shared. And the aisle after aisle after aisle after aisle of toys to check out. I was never quite clear on why there were so many toys on display. I mean, after all, didn't Santa Claus take care of all that? At some point that day, I saw something that really caught my eye. A toy I had not seen before. It was an airplane, an airliner with a gazillion little plastic pieces, passengers and luggage and, and all kinds of stuff. Caught my eye at once. I was fascinated. My grandmother noticed, too, and she suggested that I add it to my list of things to ask Santa to bring me. What a great suggestion. Why didn't I think of that myself? No wonder she was the grandmother and I was just the kid. And so I added it to my list. Later that evening, back at my grandmother's, waiting for my parents to come and pick me up. I opened up the closet in the hall that separated the living room from the dining room. I loved playing in that closet. I loved to check it out. And I did it every opportunity. I didn't even have to ask permission. It contained all kinds of incredibly neat things. I mean, there was this big old stuffed pheasant that my dad had once shot. And there were field glasses and even the perfectly folded American flag that flew from the pole out in the front of the house on very, very special occasions. Well, that night, there was something else in there. That airplane that I'd seen in Philadelphia earlier that day. There it was, right in the closet, right next to the flag. With utter astonishment, I squealed with delight, and I asked my grandmother about this incredible event. How did that plane get there? And in an almost matter-of-fact manner, she proceeded to tell me that the time had come for a little talk. You know the one. It goes something like, Well, Bobby, Santa Claus isn't really real. Isn't really real? Is that what my grandmother said? Santa Claus isn't really real? And that he doesn't really bring the toys that, that she does and, and, and my mom and dad do? Is that what she said? could have knocked me over with a feather, I suppose. Talk about being hit with a ton of bricks. I was stunned. A little later on, my mom and dad came over. And yet another conversation ensued. And it was not a pleasant one. I mean, I thought that surely my mother would straighten Grandma out on this one, but... 
instead of doing that, my mother was angry. She was angry at Grandma. She was angry at me. She seemed to be angry at the world. And there were even threats that there wouldn't even be a Christmas this year. What's the sense, she said. It was a very long, quiet ride back to my house that night. The subject of Santa Claus was never discussed again. Ever. Never again did I hear my mother say, Shh. Shh. Did you hear them? Never again were the sound of sleigh bells or reindeer hooves heard on the roof. There would be no more trips to see my old pal. No more special days in Philadelphia with my grandmother. With all the lights and the people and the sounds that I loved so much. I'm sure that we had a Christmas that year. But what I've just told you is all that I can remember of it. It's 12 minutes after three. and dramatic change in my life. It all began on a Friday night in April. It seemed like any other Friday night. My father came home from work. We ate dinner. He gave his pay over to my mother. He went upstairs to get dressed for his job and walked the dust expand. I probably helped my mother clean up the dishes. I usually did. And when my dad came back downstairs that night, transformed from a factory worker dressed in blue denim to a musician in a tuxedo, my mom kissed him goodnight. And off he went. Almost immediately, two people I had never seen before came to the door. One was a woman that my mother worked with, and the other was her husband. My mother sat me down and told me that she was leaving my father and that I was coming with her. Frantically, the three adults hurried about the house packing and moving items out the door. I was told to gather my clothes and a few of my toys from my room that we could get the rest later. Within an hour or two, we walked out the door of that house, the only home I had ever known. I would never see it again. Three adults, one child, and whatever else could be packed into a car drove off into the night. We arrived at the stranger's home, and I was taken to the basement, a more or less early day subterranean rec room, I guess is what you would call it, kind of like a finished basement, where I would spend the next three weeks in hiding, and hiding from my father. I wouldn't even see my mother. She would stay at her father's house. My father, a man that my mother said was not a nice man anymore. She said he was a man who would take me away from her if he found me. I never saw the inside of my house again. I never again saw my room. Never again saw any of my playmates or the kids I went to school with. Everything changed right there and then without any warning. It would be months before I saw my dad again, even longer before I was to see Grandmom and Jaji. Jaji, by the way, is kind of like baby talk for grandfather. Jadik, I believe, is the proper way to say it in Polish, and Jaji is kind of like saying grandpop. My relationship with all of them, my father, my grandmother, my grandfather, would never, never again be quite the same. All of these people... The only people I knew in the whole wide world were suddenly different toward me. My mother told me that they still loved me, that they were still my dad, my grandma, and Jaji, but, but that they just weren't as nice as I had previously thought. That they wanted to hurt me, that they wanted to take me away from her. I did not fully understand what was going on, but... My mother was the most important being to me in the whole wide world, and if my mother said these things, then these things must be true. And so I did as I was told to do. I spent night and day, three weeks, in a stranger's basement. After three weeks, one night my mother appeared at the top of the steps. And she was laughing and crying. She came right 
running down the steps, embraced me, and told me that a judge had awarded me to her in a custody hearing. But I didn't have to worry anymore that my dad would come and take me away. We moved into a two-room share-of-the-bath apartment that would be my home for the next six years. Collingswood, New Jersey is a fine town, a lovely town, slightly upper middle class, very prim, very proper. 103 Conard Avenue didn't quite fit into the scheme of things in Collingswood. In actuality, it stood out like a sore thumb. A once proud and spacious home had been converted into three apartments. And what had once been the dining room and the original kitchen was now my house. What had once been the pantry had been turned into a small bathroom that the two apartments on the first floor of the house shared. The good people of Collingswood were not happy about how the old place had fallen on hard times. And now housed folks who didn't quite fit in. So the neighbors looked at us kind of strange. I understand now. Now I own a home. A truck driver and his wife lived on the top floor along with their little boy, Gene and Bill Tucker, and little Billy. Billy was only three at the time and, well, frankly, way too young to be a playmater of any use to me. But his dad drove one of those gigantic big tractor trailers, and every now and then he would take me down to the gas station where they parked it and show it to me. And on top of that, Bill Tucker was a volunteer fireman. Hey, hey, this isn't so bad. This isn't so bad at all. The apartment across the hall was occupied by Ruth Thompson, a divorced woman, and her teenage daughter, Elaine. Elaine, I, well, I guess she was cute. She was a cheerleader at Collingswood High School. And way too old to be of any use to me. And I was way too young to be of any use to her. She not only used to... Uh, slide the bolt on the bathroom door but moved the hamper up against it just to make sure that I didn't come in when she was in the bathroom. Our apartment was small and cramped to say the least. The main room, the former dining room measured 9 by 12 feet. In that room were two sleeping couches two large end tables, a coffee table, a lamp table, three massive lamps an occasional chair, a bookcase and a television set and a spinet piano. And I'm not kidding. It's not unusual when a woman walks away from a marriage for her to make some kind of a statement. The piano was my mother's statement. She bought it almost immediately. My father was a relatively accomplished musician. My mother was a wannabe. My father discouraged her, said she wasn't any good at it. So as soon as she got away from him, she bought a piano. My father was right. The room was a nightmare. It was cramped and, for all practical purposes, unlivable. The good citizens of Collingswood did not take kindly to divorce in 1954. Most people shunned divorcees and their children. It was a different time, a time almost impossible to explain to young people today. And even back then, it took some getting used to. There was a new school, a whole new set of kids, a, a new town, a new neighborhood, and a radical, radical change in lifestyle. A few weeks before, I'd had my own room. Now I slept on a couch in the living room. Now I lived in something called an apartment in a strange and foreign town, and the, and the car, it was gone. It'd be many years before we had one. The furniture I had always known, it was gone. Even the dishes I was used to eating off of, they weren't there anymore. Even my toys were being held hostage in something called a property settlement. <sighs> Adults do a lot of stupid things, you know, without thinking. Strange things were going on. Like the phone would ring late at night, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, even later. There would be a hushed, very quick conversation, and then my mother would frantically get dressed and slip out the back door and be gone for hours, thinking that I hadn't heard the phone ring, thinking that I hadn't noticed her leaving. One day, I'm not really sure when she started talking about this, this new man 
and how one day we would all be living together and, and how he would be my new dad and how happy we would all be. And just, and, and, and just as soon as, as he settled things in his life, like getting out of his marriage and his four children, things would be a lot better. It became clear even to a nine-year-old why we had slipped away in the middle of the night. Spring turned to summer, and it turned to fall. Life would never be what it once was, but I was getting used to it. I was getting used to what it had become. Weekly visits with which my father started somewhere around my birthday. Six hours at a time. It usually included a stop at Grandma and Jaji's house. And usually included a trip to someplace fantastic like the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia or the zoo. But when we would go over to Grandma's, there were questions. Everybody had questions for me. Questions about my mom, questions about how we lived, questions about who she was seeing, and, and all that kind of stuff. But I had been warned about these things by my mother. She told me they would ask, and she told me what to say when they did. And then she would have her own questions for me when my dad dropped me off in the evening. My mom and my dad didn't like each other anymore. But with the fall of 1954 came Thanksgiving, and everybody knows what follows that, Christmas. And as everyone knows, there is no such thing as a bad Christmas. How could there be? There had never been a bad Christmas before. So I dutifully assembled my requests, as always. A lot of thought and preparation went into it. I remember the list to this day. There were four items on it. I wanted a big, bright, red hook-and-ladder fire engine. Just like the one they had down at the fire station. The one that my neighbor, Mr. Tucker, was the volunteer at. I had found one that looked identical to it. An American La France. I wanted that. And then there was a stagecoach that had four horses and a driver and a guard with a shotgun. And three trunks and uh, two passengers. And I wanted a powder blue futuristic Buick convertible. It had working headlights and the uh, trunk opened and there was a spare tire and a little jack and a wrench. And the hood opened and there was a motor inside there and you could change the tires and I wanted that. And there was a microscope set that I wanted. And I also wanted a complete set of slides, you know, so I could look at, look at them through the microscope. Well, when my mother asked me what I wanted for Christmas, I told her. And when my father asked me what I wanted for Christmas, I told him. The truth of the matter is that they didn't just not like each other anymore. They hated each other. And they had had no communication whatsoever from the kiss goodbye that Friday night in April until just a few days before Christmas. I have no idea of exactly how the communication link was reestablished or who initiated it. But it was decided that we would all celebrate Christmas together at the apartment on Christmas Eve. Well, of course, you can't have Christmas Eve without a tree, and you can't have Christmas tree without, without trains. But there was, of course, that minor problem of the somewhat crowded condition in the living room. So out into the hall went the piano, blocking it for all practical purposes. But the Tuckers and the Thompsons seemed to understand, and they squeezed by best they could for a couple of weeks. My father arrived extra early that day, dressed in a suit, as people did back then when they came to call. And along with him, he brought the trains and the Plasticville houses and the Plasticville stores and the Plasticville church and the mountain paper and everything. And he took off his suit jacket and loosened his tie, rolled up his sleeves, and prepared to assemble it all. I watched in utter amazement. My mother was out in the kitchen preparing the ham and the potato salad. So maybe it wasn't exactly like all of the previous Christmases, but it was close enough, right? It was close enough. But after we ate, it was time for the main event, the presents, baby. My dad made three trips from the car. The anticipation was building. There was a last-minute discussion concerning the order that the gifts would be opened in, and my father apparently smug in the knowledge that he had gotten me everything that I asked for, graciously said that his presence could wait for last. 
my mom presented the first of hers. It was a bright red hook and ladder fire engine. All right. And that was followed by a microscope set along with a complete set of slides. And then there was that Buick convertible I wanted. And that was topped off with the stagecoach. Bingo! A home run! All right! Life doesn't get any better than this. Or does it? Well, I guess it all depends on your perspective. I had noticed that my father did not seem to share my joy as I opened each and every one of these treasures. It soon became apparent why. That Christmas, I received two of everything that I had asked for. In subsequent, in subsequent years, the two former lovebirds swallowed their pride and shared notes. Something they had failed to do for the Christmas of 1954. Christmas Day had always been spent at my house Christmas Eve at my grandmother's. In 1954, it was Christmas Eve at my house and Christmas Day at Aunt Kate's. Aunt Kate and Uncle Franny's. That's where Grandpa Welsh also lived. I liked Aunt Kate, I liked Uncle Franny, and I liked the five kids. I liked them all very, very much. And so it seemed kind of neat to be going into their house for Christmas. I had never done that before. And so when we arrived on Christmas Day, Aunt Kate called me out into the kitchen. And then she asked me to step outside. Well, this was very unusual. One of the adults wanting to chat with you privately outside? Okay. All right. We stepped out into the backyard and Aunt Kate hemmed and hauled, made a little bit of small talk and... Then she got down to the real business of the, of the chat. Aunt Kate and Uncle Franny and Grandpa Welsh were very, very devout Catholics. And they did their best to raise their children the same. And as devout Catholics, they absolutely despised divorce. And they thought it best that the children knew nothing about divorce. And there seemed to be a bit of a problem in that I was there. And my mother was there, but my father, Uncle Henry, he wasn't there. And this was Christmas Day, and just in case the kids asked where Uncle Henry was, could I please tell them that Uncle Henry was a cowboy and he was away on a cattle drive? Uncle Henry was on a cattle drive for any number of years on Christmas Day. I always thought it was kind of stupid. You know what? Kids had figured it out anyway. It's 3.33. <laughs> is the next year that comes to mind. We were still living in the apartment at 103 Conard Avenue. The piano was gone now, and the two sleeping couches had been replaced by something called Castro Convertibles. It was a bit more room, but, I mean, after all, the mature boy of 12 no longer required a train set under the trees, and beside, his father was no longer as thrilled to come by on Christmas Eve and set it up. Christmas gifts were exchanged between the boy and the father during regular Sunday visits. The trains and my father were never again to be part of my Christmas from that point on. My mother had an uncle, Uncle John, a parish priest stationed in Matasquan, New Jersey, a seaside resort. I'd never met Uncle John, but all of my life I had heard about him. He was my grandfather, Grandpa Welsh. He was his oldest brother, the only one of the brothers who was actually born in Ireland. And of course, the only one who had the vocation. Each year, Uncle John would send us a Christmas card. And in the Christmas card was a check either for $10 or $15, year after year after year. And each year, my mother would hand it over to me so that I might have some, some money for a little Christmas shopping of my own. How you got your money is not important as a child. Just having it so that you can buy presents for your mom is all that really matters. The card arrived just before Thanksgiving. It did every year. Of course, we had the Friday after Thanksgiving off from school, and my mom also had the day off from work. It was an ideal situation. 
chance to get the shopping out of the way, you know? A bright and early Friday morning, a girlfriend from the office, Maria, came by and picked up my mother, and off they went for what was supposed to be a day of shopping. I went off on my own to downtown Collingswood. I was gone maybe an hour, possibly two. Ten dollars went a lot further in those days than it does now, but it still wasn't a princely sum of money. Well, I selected one of those newfangled items that was being advertised all over the television. A lady chic electric razor. The announcer said it would make an ideal Christmas present. It was black. With a circular insert of flowers, it came in a powder blue box. I was sure that it was a gift of a lifetime, something that my mother would treasure all the days of her life. It was late afternoon now, almost time for supper, but my mom still had not come home. Now it was dark outside, and still there was no word from her. Sometime around seven, the car pulled up out front, and Maria seemed to be seemed to be helping my mother up the walk. My mother could barely barely walk on her own. When they came into the house, Maria told me to go out into the kitchen. She, she said that my mom had gotten sick when they were shopping. I opened the sofa bed. My mom laid down. Maria said because my mom needed rest, a lot of rest, and that she was sick, very sick. Maria stayed for over an hour. Finally, she left, and my mom called for me. She started saying very, very strange things, really bad things that I didn't want to hear. Things like that if anything should happen to her, that she wanted me to go live with Aunt Kate. And she started talking about how sorry she was that everything had happened the way it did and, and how I didn't deserve all of this. And, and she started to cry, and I asked her if she was, I asked her if she was going to die. And she cried all the more, never answering me. I didn't know what to do. I was more than scared. I never felt like that in my entire life. And then it came to me, out in the kitchen, hidden way in the back of the cupboard, was the gift of a lifetime. Maybe, just maybe if I gave it to her now, even though it was just the day after Thanksgiving, maybe if I gave it to her now, maybe, maybe it would help her get better. So I did. I gave her the Lady Schick electric razor right then and there on the spot. It would be several years before I knew just what had happened that day. Why my mom left to go shopping healthy and all and then came home ever so sick. She spent the next week in bed slowly recovering, slowly regaining her strength from all the blood that she had lost. It's one of the reasons I feel so strongly that women should never again have to turn to butchers to end a pregnancy. The living room was dark when I handed the present to her. The only illumination, the only light was coming from the kitchen. She took it and literally clutched it to her heart. She told me that it was a wonderful present, what she had always wanted. She told me that it made her very, very happy. Of course, there would be nothing for me to give her on Christmas Day, but... This was an emergency. You know, I never knew her to use that damn thing. I don't think she ever did. For a while, it sat on her dresser. And then one day, it just disappeared. It's 3.42. was a um, strange year. Well, the truth of the matter is it was really a rotten Christmas. You know, sometimes kids do, do stupid things like uh, run away from home right before Christmas. I spent the Christmas of 1960 
on the 16th floor at the YMCA in downtown Manhattan on 34th Street. I don't know why I ran away, and I sure as hell don't know why I ran away at that time of the year. But nonetheless, I was there at the YMCA in a tiny little cramped room. Very little money. Feeling very, very sorry for myself, I'll have you know. It was Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, the day that had always been such a big day in my life. The day where I had always been the center of attention and surrounded by people who loved me. Not this one. I wasn't surrounded by anyone. To kill the time and help ease the boredom, I took a nap. Somewhere around 5, 5.30, I woke up, and I was hungry. I was very hungry. So I got dressed, and I stepped outside to find out that there had been a snowfall. It was the first white Christmas I had ever seen in my life. About five, maybe five and a half inches of snow had fallen unexpectedly in downtown Manhattan, and it was the most beautiful sight that you can begin to imagine. And right down the street, around the corner from the YMCA, Sloan House, I think is what they call it, is a hotel, the Hotel Manhattan. They had a carol on, and it played silver bells. Needless to say, it brought tears to my eyes. But strangely enough, I still remember it with fond memories. In 1963, I had my first real girlfriend, an honest-to-God girlfriend, Carol, um... Carol, uh, what's her name? You know, I can still see her, I just can't remember her name. I spent the princely sum of $90 on her that Christmas, an entire week's pay. We broke up before the new year. 1970 was spent in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. That's where I broke into radio. I decided to do a very honorable thing, and I gave all of the staff Christmas Day off. But, of course, the radio station had to stay on the air. But we were just going to play Christmas music anyway, one album after another, just play the sides of them. The station was on the air for 15 and a half hours a day. Christmas Day would be no different. I showed up bright and early in the morning and turned on the station and started to play Christmas music. We didn't have a lot of Christmas music, and the station at that time was what is referred to in the business as a beautiful music station. And so our Christmas music was very lush, a lot of violins, and very mellow. Have you ever listened to 15 and a half hours of goddamn Christmas music nonstop? Somewhere around 1 o'clock, one of the guys that worked at the station came by. His mom had cooked a humongous Christmas feast and sent a dish over for me. And his father was renowned for his killer eggnog. They sent a quart of that, too. Boy, that dinner was good. And that eggnog? Ha! Huh. They didn't call it killer eggnog for nothing. So now here it is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I've heard of just about all the Christmas music I ever wanted to hear. I'm drunk on my ass. In 1972, I was working in Utica, New York. I was the general manager of the station. I gave myself Christmas off. I wasn't going to pull a stunt like I did in St. Thomas. Payday was to be Christmas Eve. I wanted to be home for Christmas Eve. It would be the first Christmas Eve I had been home in quite, a t quite some time, and, and so I left early. And I gave all the paychecks to my loyal, trusted assistant to hand out. Well, he wanted to be home for Christmas Eve, too. And he didn't feel like sticking around the radio station to hand out the paychecks, so he tacked them all to the bulletin board. But unfortunately, he didn't put them in envelopes. And so everybody got to see what everybody else earned. I got a frantic call at home on Christmas Eve that all of my employees were quitting. Being so angry that there was such a disparity between what one disc jockey was getting and what another disc jockey was getting. And even the secretary was unhappy that the overnight man was getting more than her and she could type 60 words a minute and on and on and on and on. And I had to get in my car and drive back to Utica on the spot. 
I didn't get to spend Christmas 1972 at home. By 1973, I was married. I had left the job in Utica. And I found myself living in an apartment without any furniture. Without a job. Rapidly running out of money. And Christmas was bearing down on us. We couldn't put Christmas off any longer. It was the day before Christmas Eve. We woke up that morning and my wife complained of not feeling very well. But we went out nonetheless and we bought a Christmas tree. Spent $30 on it. That was a lot of money. Almost all the damn money we had. Brought the tree home. Parked the car out in front of the apartment. I was carrying the tree into the house when I heard a crash. I turned and looked over my shoulder to see that one of my neighbors had slid on the ice and smashed into the back of my pride and joy. My 1972 Volvo 1800 ES. My wife still wasn't feeling well. She said maybe we'd better go to the hospital. So I took her to the emergency room. I sat there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. I looked up and I saw her and a nurse walking down the hall. My wife, the first one, Lara, had the most dreadful expression on her face. The nurse had this big, silly grin. I stood up and walked toward them and the nurse said, You're going to be a daddy. I was not amused. We drove home the back of my beautiful Volvo 1800 ES in a shambles only to discover that the cat had broken into our dope and eaten it this is all true that night with a few dollars remaining I drove over to the Kmart to pick up some lights for the Christmas tree it was raining my windshield wipers weren't functioning properly someone had left a shopping cart out in the middle of a lot I plowed into it smashing up the front of my beautiful 1972 Volvo 1800 ES it was a delightful Christmas that year in 1977 we were having some troubles and we had separated around Thanksgiving we were living in Norfolk, Virginia my wife went home to her parents who lived in Otter Lake, New York, in upstate New York, in the Adirondacks. We decided to reconcile, and she invited me up to spend Christmas up there with her family. I drove for 14 hours from Norfolk to Otter Lake. One of the most beautiful places on the face of the earth. It was only the second time I had seen snow on Christmas. It looked more like a Courier and Ives Christmas card than anything else. It was beautiful. Just absolutely beautiful. And we did reconcile. And we had a good Christmas. It's good to spend Christmas in the mountains. We can step outside and hear absolutely positively nothing. We can look up into the sky where there's no pollution. No lights coming from afar. And see a gazillion stars. You can understand how maybe three wise men once saw a special star and followed it. It's 3.56. It was my first in Florida. And like all people who moved to Florida, we were absolutely fascinated that in November, in early December, the weather was warm and, oh, God, it was great. 
I hadn't lived at home for many years. So we tried to bring my mother in for the holidays because, frankly, she had no one else but me. The years had not been kind to our relationship. To put it bluntly, I didn't like my mother. I loved her. But it had gotten to the point where I didn't like her. She was a shallow woman and, frankly, kind of stupid. She was one of those women that she didn't know what to talk to me about, so she would ask me dumb questions. And it drove me insane. Her life was a disaster, and it was so because she had messed up at virtually every turn. But I was a dutiful son. I called her every week and almost always hid my displeasure with her. And of course, in 1981, I imported the old girl for her Christmas. I did every year, whether we could afford it or not. I never troubled my mother with any of my misfortune, nor did I trouble her with any of my good fortune. She never had any idea how much money I made or anything else along those lines. 1981 was not a stellar year financially. It started off okay. I had been working in Pittsburgh. The station I was at changed formats and my contract was bought out for a ton of money. And so what the hell? I moved to Florida and retired from radio to trade commodity futures, something I'd always wanted to do. I never really made any money at it. I never really lost any money. It was you know, a couple of bucks here, a couple of bucks there, up, down, up, down, up, down. And then one terrible, dreadful day, one day, I lost it all. So coming up with the $400 to fly her down was a burden. It was a big one. But my wife was very understanding. There had been other years when it was very difficult to bring in my mother. And we scraped together the money and sent it to her. She arrived on December 12th that year for a one-month stay. The weather had been fantastic until the day she arrived. I don't really think it had anything to do with it, but it turned cold and gray for the entire month. The visit was a visit from hell. We sniped at each other constantly. She had something to say about everything, even down to correcting my wife on the direction of the flatware and how it should go into the dishwasher. On and on it went, day and night, day after miserable day. At one point, I snapped at her, telling her to mind her own goddamn business, that she was in my house and at my expense, and that if she didn't like it, I would be only too happy to take her back to the airport. It was a delightful family Christmas that year. My mother was a strange woman. She was a good woman, but she was afraid of offending people. So she would tell you whatever she thought you wanted to hear to the extreme. For example, she knew my feelings on God. So around me, she was a non-believer. Her sisters, on the other hand, were devout believers, devout Catholics, and had the kids to prove it. And so around them, my mother was a devout believer. I never really knew what she believed. At one point during the visit, she had a conversation with Lara. It was a conversation that would cost me my entire family in the days ahead. The conversation dealt with her death. She was only 60 years old at the time. But she had a long conversation with Lara about the fact that when she died, she wanted no religious service, she wanted no viewing. She wished to be cremated. The views were strikingly close to mine and in direct opposition to her religion. Well, anyway, the month came to an end, and we loaded her on a plane and sent her home. Literally, walking back to the car from the airport, I said to Lara that next year would be different, that next year I would not, under any circumstances, under any condition, for any reason whatsoever, bring my mother down, that she, Lara, and I would have a decent peaceful, quiet Christmas with an extra 400 bucks in our pocket. 1982 was indeed a different Christmas. It was a pleasant one. Sometime in the fall, my mother started hinting about the upcoming Christmas visit. Well, I cut her short. 
And I explained to her that we simply could not afford to bring her down that year. It was a lie. It was a bald-faced lie. Total and complete fabrication. The truth was that I didn't want her around. I knew that there was no way that she could ever come up with the money on her own. So if I didn't provide it, I was free and clear of her. Maybe the next year. But not this one. This Christmas belonged to me and my wife. This Christmas was not going to be full of sniping and snarling and bickering and stupid questions. Of course, she was devastated. I was her only child. Her family had mostly moved away. And now she was living in a retirement community about 90 miles away from where she had grown up, where she had spent her entire life, and where she knew virtually no one. A week or so before Christmas, she told me that one of the volunteers had invited her to come to the house for the big day, for Christmas Day. I was already feeling a little bit guilty about it all, and so that news made me feel somewhat better. At least she wouldn't be sitting all by herself in her little efficiency apartment. had a wonderful Christmas with a few extra dollars in our pocket. One day in late January, I came home from work. Lara was waiting for me and said that my mother had called. It was a Tuesday. It was very unusual for my mother to call. It was even more unusual for her to call on a Tuesday. Lara said that she was very, very upset. She wouldn't tell Lara what the matter was. But she wanted me to call her immediately. I did. She had been having some pain in her arm, in her shoulder. And finally she went to see the doctor. They did some tests, took some x-rays. And they discovered that the source of the pain in her arm to do with the size of the tumor on her lung that was pushing against the muscle mass and the nerves. She was scared. Real scared. Of course, I tried to be encouraging and all that. We talked about how she was going to beat it. and It was downhill from there. She died September the 8th, 1983. was I to know that it was her last Christmas. A few days later, after she died, we drove north to clean out her apartment, a small efficiency in Cape May, New Jersey. She had very little to show for her 61 years on this earth. Life had not been kind to her. apartment was relatively sparsely furnished. It was really nothing more than a warehouse of Christmas gifts I had given her down through the years that she had never parted with. The kind of things a kid would buy his mother. There was a gaudy decanter set for a woman who did not drink. An even gaudier rhinestone necklace and matching bracelet. A sailing ship rigging chart stupid items but they were her treasures there was very little in the place that I wanted to keep I donated most of it to the local fire department for their rummage sale it took probably the best part of an hour to clean out her closet there were two closets in her apartment a small coat closet right inside the front door and a double closet over by the bed Last years, she had become quite a hockey fan, and the double closet was filled with newspaper clippings. That's all that were in there. Newspaper clippings, hockey scores, hockey stories, hockey interviews. All neatly bundled. We worked our way into the bathroom. There wasn't much in there either. 
some threadbare towels, half-used bottles of Jurgen's lotion and the like. And there, in the cabinet under the sink, so old and stained by the years at first I didn't recognize it was a box. A powder blue box. Inside was a pristine Lady Schick electric razor. It had never been used. Twenty-six years later. And she still had it. I guess the man on the television ad was right when he said it made the ideal gift. One that would please any woman. It's 18 minutes after four. to the letter. She was taken directly from the hospital to the crematorium. There was no memorial service. There was no visitation. It's what she had told my wife that she wanted. Unfortunately, she had told her sisters the exact opposite. <clears throat> I didn't hear from my family uh, that Christmas. I haven't heard from them since. They think I'm some kind of a monster. It's okay. 1983 was the last Christmas I was to spend with Laura. We spent it with her family. I like Christmas. I like it very much. I like it. I like getting to, but I like giving. We had had trouble throughout our entire marriage. Some years were better than others. I thought 1983 was okay. But something very, very strange happened as we were driving home Christmas night. She told me that I'd given her too many gifts. She told me that I embarrassed her in front of her family. I don't know why I didn't see the handwriting on the wall, but we had reached a point in our relationship where virtually everything I did annoyed her. We wouldn't be together for Christmas in 1984. We would be in the middle of a divorce. Round about Thanksgiving, I began to panic. I was going to spend Christmas alone, and I didn't want to spend Christmas alone. When you're pushing 40, it's not a good thing to do. I was amazed that there were a lot of other people who were also going to be spending Christmas alone. And who were also starting to panic. A remarkable number of relationships started around Thanksgiving and last well, just after Christmas. I had one of them that year. It was a hard year financially. I only had $50 to spend for Christmas. $50 to spend for Christmas. I don't know why I did it, but I spent 30 of it on an ounce of dope for my ex-wife. Which left $20 to spend on my new love. I wasn't used to being limited to a lousy 20 bucks to spend for Christmas, for God's sake. For the entire Christmas. And I went to the mall on Christmas Eve. I usually did my Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve until relatively recently. I learned my lesson. The mall was to close at 6.30, and by 6 o'clock, I still hadn't found anything. I was in an absolute panic. I finally found a few trinkets and spent Christmas Eve with my new girlfriend. It wasn't quite the same, but it was better than being alone. When I got home that night, I found that my, my wife had stopped by the house and had left a Christmas present for me. I was very, very touched. It was sitting there on the table. Nicely wrapped. There was a little note thanking me for the dope. And I unwrapped the present, and it was a beautiful, beautiful set of towels. Beautiful Brazilian towels. Absolutely. My God, the woman had never displayed such good taste before in our entire marriage. And then I realized it was a set of towels for one. 
All the audacity. Bitch thought I'd never find anybody else, so why give me a set of towels for two, I guess. I still have one of them. Keep it as a joke. The Christmas of 1985 started out to be the worst possible Christmas of them all. The divorce was final now. I was working at WPLP, living in St. Petersburg in an efficiency apartment, a furnished efficiency apartment. I didn't know a soul up here. You'll remember my family thought I was a monster for having my mother cremated against the wishes of the Catholic Church and for not holding a viewing for her, which she told me she didn't want. And I, frankly, was feeling pretty damn sorry for myself, I don't mind telling you. I was feeling incredibly sorry for myself. And it was Christmas Eve morning, and there wasn't going to be any presents, and there wasn't going to be nothing. And I was sitting there, and I said, wait a second. Wait a second. What the hell are you feeling sorry for yourself for? You've had a lot of good Christmases. You've had a lot of good years. Go on, make your own Christmas. There was one of those shipping barrels in the closet that my wife had put together for me when we were splitting up our goodies. She had labeled it Christmas Treasures. I figured, okay, I'll break out some decorations. And I'll go to the store. And I'll get a Polish ham and I'll, I'll get some potatoes and some mayonnaise and some, and, and some celery and, and an onion. And I'll make my damn potato salad and I'll have my damn Polish ham. And I'm going to have Christmas anyway. I don't... I don't need presents, and I don't need a lot of people. And that's exactly what I did. I went to the store, and I got that Polish ham, and I came home, and I peeled the potatoes, and I boiled them. And while I was boiling the potatoes, I opened that barrel that said Christmas treasures. Over the years, we had accumulated quite a number of very nice Christmas decorations. Over the years, we had also accumulated quite a pile of <clears throat> less than nice Christmas decorations. The wife considered herself to be quite a craftswoman. Unfortunately, she wasn't. And she had spent a great deal of time, effort, energy, and money on do-it-yourself Christmas decorations that looked like they were made by a three-year-old. You'll never guess what was in the barrel. Yeah. There was also a ceramic Christmas tree that my mother had made and a ceramic Santa Claus and... So I took those out, and I set them up on the table. And I had my ham, and I had my potato salad. And I sat there, and I did, in essence, what I've done with you this afternoon. I started to relive all the Christmases past. And magically, the room started to fill with people. The cousins, the aunts, the uncles, my mom and my dad. The train set was under the tree. It was one of the best Christmases I ever had in my entire life. I was forced to sit there and make my own Christmas. I was forced to sit there and bring back all the Christmases of the past. All the people of the past who had been part of Christmas. Because that's what it is. That's what Christmas is. It's memories. One heaped upon another. One adding to the other. It was a damned good Christmas. A damned good Christmas. One that I'm very glad that I celebrated. By 1986, I was with Mary. And we combined her traditions with my traditions. And I went out and I bought a, what I thought was a very special present. keyboard. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that keyboards came in two sizes, little keys and big ones. I bought one with the little keys, one that's almost impossible to play. That was eight years ago. She still hasn't mentioned it. Still doesn't try to play it. By 1989, we were in Chicago. And boy, was it a Christmas. We were in the money, I'll have you know. 
it was a Christmas beyond my wildest dreams. My wildest, wildest dreams and expectations. Money like you, oh, God. Great presents, big presents, lavish presents, expensive presents, and a magical city. Have you ever been in Chicago during Christmas time? Have you ever seen that city? Have you ever seen the Miracle Mile, Michigan Avenue, with all the trees done up in white lights and all the beautiful stores and all the beautiful decorations? Have you ever been to Marshall Fields? You people who have not lived in a big city, you don't know what a department store is. <laughs> Dillard's is not a department store, for God's sake. J.C. Penney's is not a department store. You've got to go to downtown Marshall Fields, man. A full square block, seven, eight, nine, ten stories. Same thing in Philadelphia at Wanamaker. Same thing in Pittsburgh at Kaufman's. Oh, what a Christmas. And there was a tree in Chicago that I'll never forget. It was in the lobby of the building that I worked in. A beautiful tree. One of the most beautifully decorated trees I have ever seen in my entire life. The tree was decorated by the guard who worked the night shift. An immigrant from Iran named Mohammed, a Muslim. But boy, he sure knew how to decorate Christmas trees. 1992 was spent in Davenport. It was a simple down-to-earth Christmas. I'd like the one in 1989 in Chicago. But it was a good one. And in 1993, we bought a house for Christmas. Maybe the best one of them all. It's 432. <laughs> Christmas time. One was Mrs. Powell. Mrs. Powell was the mother of a girl that I had a horrible, horrible crush on. But on my own way, I guess I also had a crush on Mrs. Powell. She was one of the most fascinating women I've ever known in my entire life. She was a waitress. Mother of three children. One of the best read, most intelligent women I've ever known. Would sit and talk with her for hour upon hour upon hour. Mrs. Powell would have nothing to do with Christmas. Absolutely, positively, nothing to do with Christmas. It's not that she was a, a humbug or a Scrooge or something like that. She just felt that spending a lot of time on Christmas uh, was a waste of time and energy, that there were other things to do. There were books to read and people to converse with, and I don't know what else. And then, on Christmas Eve, every year that I ever knew her, perhaps 10 or 12, I'm not sure, but a long time. Every year, without fail, on Christmas Eve, Mrs. Powell would be filled with more Christmas spirit than you can begin to imagine. And on Christmas Eve, she would go out and buy a tree and bring it home and decorate it. She would buy presents for three girls and wrap them. She would go to the grocery store and buy a Christmas feast. And on Christmas Day, the girls would get up and that tree would be there and the presents would be under it and a Christmas feast would be cooked. And by bedtime Christmas night, it was gone. The tree had been taken down and hauled out to the curb. And all signs of Christmas were gone. It happened every year that way. I don't know why. I just sat back and watched it. For 24 hours, she had more Christmas spirit than anyone I have ever known in my entire life. 24 hours. One day a year. 
And then there was Mrs. Boswell. They should write stories about Mrs. Boswell. They should maybe make a movie about her. She was an extraordinary woman as well. She didn't appear to be. She was a rather homely-looking woman, to tell you the truth. Rather frumpy with her hair up. Wore those glasses with the with a string attached to them around her neck so they wouldn't fall off. She owned the house that we lived in at 103 Conard Avenue. And she also owned Boswell's gift store on the corner of Collings and Haddon Avenue, the only gift shop in town. And a fine one, too, thank you. Mrs. Boswell was older than my mother. I'm not sure how much older, but at least 15 or 20 years. She had gone through a lot of the things that my mother had gone through, but unlike my mother, she had picked herself up off off the ground, dusted herself off, and, and made something of her life. She had become a businesswoman and a successful businesswoman with her own store and rental properties. But she understood how difficult it was to raise a son without a man in the house. And while she was a shrewd and sharp businesswoman, she was also a human being with a heart as big as gold. Every year, as I had mentioned earlier, my my mother's uncle John would send a ten or a fifteen dollar check, and every year that check was turned over to me, and that's what I used to buy my mother Christmas presents. And every year, for quite a number of years, five, six, maybe longer, I'm not really clear on that, I would go to Boswell's gift shop at the corner of Haddon and Collins. And Mrs. Boswell would allow me to go through the store and pick out any item that I wanted. Any item that I wanted. But Mrs. Boswell thought that not only was it important that a son buy his mother a Christmas present, but she also thought that it was important that a son leave the store with dignity. So I would select whatever gift caught my eye and bring it to the front counter. And every year, Mrs. Boswell would work the same ruse on me. She would somehow get me to tell her how much money I had. And every year, no matter what I had selected, it always cost just a little bit less than the amount of money I brought in. So that I would leave not only with a present for my mother, which Mrs. Boswell would wrap beautifully, but I would also leave with change. I was an adult before I realized what Mrs. Boswell had done. And I told that story one day while working at WFLA. And lo and behold, I got a phone call from someone, a listener, who said, I know Mrs. Boswell. She's still alive. And she gave me Mrs. Boswell's address. And I sat down and I wrote a letter to her. And I thanked her for all the acts of kindness over all those years. And told her that I had finally figured out what she had done and how very, very appreciative I was. And what a fine human being I thought she was for having done that. And for allowing me to keep my dignity as well. And I sent off the letter. And I never heard from her. The next year I told the story again. And I also added the fact that I had sent Mrs. Boswell a letter. And that I never heard from her. Again, the same listener called and said, Oh my God, I gave you the wrong address. And gave me another address. Mrs. Boswell was now well into her 80s. And so once again, I sat down and I wrote a letter thanking her for all that she had done. This time I did get a reply. I would be lying to you if, if I said that Christmas is nothing but giving. It's also getting. And I would 
be lying to you if I said that some of the gifts that I have received over the years didn't mean more to me than others. There was an English racer that I received when I was 10 years old. I wanted it so very, very bad. Do they still call them English racers? It was a bicycle, a lightweight bicycle with hand brakes and gears. They were very, very exotic back then. And I woke up one Christmas morning to find a black English racer waiting for me. Years after that, I received one single share of Tasty Cake stock. You've heard me talk about Tasty Cakes. You know what they mean to me. That share of Tasty Cake stock was one of the greatest gifts I ever received. It was worth about 17 bucks at the time. I have no idea what it's worth now. I still have the certificate. I wouldn't part with it for all the money in the world. It was a Zippo lighter that Muffy gave me one year. Simple Zippo lighter. I don't know why. It means all means everything to me. It's broken. Has been for years. I'll never part with it. And there was another silly gift. A pair of fuzzy dice that my sister-in-law gave me. Mary's sister. She had gone out and got one of those pair of fuzzy dice, you know, with a, you know, you, you know what they look like. You hang them on your rearview mirror, right? Only she had removed all of the black dots on it and replaced them with burgundy dots to match the <laughs> dead cowskin seats in my Lincoln. You know, I hung them up there. I don't know why. I just loved it. It's 446. This is certainly uh, no time to get involved in a discussion of religion and whose religion is better and who's got more faith than the other person. But would it surprise you? Would it surprise you to know that once I sang the solo of O Holy Night at 9 a.m. Mass at St. John's Church in Collingswood, New Jersey? It's true. I was 11 years old, 1956. The 9 a.m. Mass, mind you, that's the important one. I don't know how it came about. I was selected sometime in late September or early October. And almost every afternoon from the time I was chosen until the day of the event, I would come home, stand in the kitchen and practice singing Oh Holy Night over and over and over again. I still love that song. Would it surprise you to know that I still sometimes break out and sing it? No, I'm not going to. I didn't do it that well then, and I do it a hell of a lot worse now. That was the same year, 1956, that I cranked poor old George the cop. Maybe it's why, maybe it's why, maybe it's all part of God's plan or something that I, I now have to put up with cranks. Collingswood, New Jersey is a relatively small town, about 17,000 people, and I don't know if they still do this. It's been a long time since I was there, but when I was a child, we actually had our own Christmas parade and our own Christmas decorations. And out in front of the Bonsall School on Haddon Avenue, every year they would erect a building, a little, a little lean-to up against the school, and put up a sign that said, Santa's Workshop. And every afternoon... Santa Claus would magically appear to listen to the wishes and dreams of the children of Collingswood, New Jersey. Well, by 1956, I was hip to the score, if you get my drift. And all of the kids that were hip to the score knew that Santa Claus was really George the Cop, for God's sake. Now, the good citizens of Collingswood, New Jersey, thought that it would be very cute if the children of the city who went to see Santa Claus 
were broadcast over a loudspeaker, and so George, excuse me, Santa had a microphone. And of course, it's kind of difficult to say for sure just when a child, you know, stops believing, and you know, some are younger than others, and 11 is not unheard of, right? Well, it wasn't back then. 12 and 13 wasn't unheard of back then. And I recall getting together with my friends and going up to see George, uh, Santa one afternoon, waiting in line, sitting on George's lap with a microphone in his hand and exposing him to the entire town. You're not Santa Claus! You're George the Cop! I think I'd pay for that indiscretion. Every day of my life, every single miserable day of my life, God gets even with me for having done that. And now as the years go by, as the memories add one to the other, still new traditions come on board. Every year now, we wait for a box of cookies and candies from Davenport, Iowa. Where the girls, my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law, spend days baking and baking and baking and baking and putting together little care packages. And I wait for them every year. There was a new one this year, by the way, a new candy mold. I noticed it immediately. Huh. I had to point it out to my wife. I mean, I'm telling you, a new candy mold is something to note. It doesn't happen every year. And then there was something else. A long time ago, ten years ago now, I guess almost, close enough anyway, a man that I worked with read a poem on the air. A beautiful poem. The poem was called A Cup of Christmas Tea. It's about an elderly relative and a young person who was asked to go and visit her for Christmas. The poem moved me to no end. I can't describe to you the the feelings, the emotions it brought. Even though I I have nothing comparable in my life. I don't have any elderly, elderly relatives. I, I've never been forced to go see somebody that I didn't want to go see for Christmas. And hell, now I'm closer to the age of the elderly relative than I am of the young person they talk about in the poem. But my friend and colleague David Fowler read it on the air one day. And it absolutely blew me away. I mentioned it when I was in Chicago. And a young couple that we met in Chicago, some listeners that we befriended, which is very unusual. I don't normally socialize with listeners, but a young couple, a young woman who was a medical student and her husband who was a computer programmer, were regular listeners to the show and they, they heard me talk about it. When I lost the gig in Chicago and we were spending our last Christmas there. On Christmas Eve morning, the, the phone rang. It was a doorman downstairs and he said that Donna, the young woman, was downstairs and wanted to come up and promised only to stay for a moment. And would it be okay if they sent her up? Of course, yes. And she came up to the apartment and she handed me a present. It was beautifully wrapped. I asked if I could open it then, and she said yes. And I opened it up, and it was the poem, A Cup of Christmas Tea. And if you would be kind enough to indulge me, when we come back, I'd like to share it with you. It's 4.56. Cheeks. 
It was to be my last Christmas in Chicago, a city that I had come to thinking that I was going to conquer, and I was about to leave it, having done anything but conquer it. But maybe it hadn't been such a failure after all. Here was the poem that I had heard only once so long ago, and this young woman, who used to listen to the show, who heard me talk about it, was moved enough by it and by what we did, and she went out and found it and brought it to me. And if I may. The log was in the fireplace, all spiced and set to burn. At last, the early Christmas race was in the clubhouse turn. The cards were in the mail, the gifts beneath the tree. And 30 days reprieve till the visa could catch up with me. And though smug satisfaction seemed the order of the day, something still was nagging me and would not go away. A week before I got a letter from my old great aunt, it read, Of course I'll understand completely if you can't, but if you find you have some time, how wonderful if we could have a little chat and share a cup of Christmas tea. She'd had a mild stroke that year, which crippled her left side. Though housebound now, my folks had said it hadn't hurt her pride. They said she'd love to see you. What a nice thing it would be for you to go and maybe have a cup of Christmas tea. But boy, I didn't want to go. Oh, what a bitter pill to see an old relation and how far she'd gone downhill. I remembered her as vigorous, as funny, and as bright. I remembered Christmas Eves when she regaled us half the night. I didn't want to risk all that. I didn't want the pain. I didn't need to be depressed. I didn't need the strain. And what about my brother? She's his aunt, too. I thought I had it justified. But then before I knew, the reasons not to go I so painstakingly had built were cracking wide and crumbling in an acid rain of guilt. I put on boots and gloves and cap, shame stinging every pore. And armed with squeegee sand and mop, I went out my front door. I drove in from the suburbs to the older part of town. The pastels of the newer homes gave way to gray and brown. I had that disembodied feeling as the car pulled up and stopped beside the wooden house that held the Christmas cup. How I got up to the door, I really couldn't tell. I watched my hand rise up and press the button of the bell. I waited, aided by my nervous rocking to and fro, and just as I was thinking I should turn around and go... I heard the rattle of the china and the hutch against the wall. The triple beat of two feet in a crutch came down the hall. The clicking of the door latch and the sliding of the bolt. And a little swollen struggle popped it open with a jolt. She stood there pale and tiny. Looking fragile as an egg, I forced myself from staring at the brace that held her leg. And though her thick bifocal seemed to crack and spread her eyes, their milky and refracted depths lit up with young surprise. Come in, come in, she laughed the words. She took me by the hand. And all my fears dissolved away as if by her command. We went inside, and then before I knew how to react, before my eyes and ears and nose was Christmas, past, alive, intact. The scent of candied oranges, of cinnamon and pine, the... Antique wooden soldiers in their military line. The porcelain nativity I'd, I'd always loved so much. The Dresden and the crystal I'd been told I mustn't touch. My spirit fairly bolted like a child out of class and danced among the ornaments of calico and glass. Like magic, I was six again, deep in a Christmas spell. Steeped in the million memories the boy inside knew well. And here, among old Christmas cards, so lovingly displayed... A special place of honor for the ones we kids had made. And there, beside her rocking chair, in the center of it all, my great aunt stood and said, How nice it was I'd come to call. I sat and rattled on about the weather and the flu. She listened very patiently and smiled and said, What's new? Thoughts and words began to flow. I started making sense. I lost that phony breeziness I use when I get tense. She was still passionately interested in everything I did. She was positive, encouraging, like when I was a kid. Simple generalities still sent her into fits. She demanded the specifics, the particulars, the bits. We 
talked about the limitations that she'd had to face. She spoke with utter candor and with humor and good grace. When defying the reality of crutch and straightened knee, on the wings of hospitality she flew to brew the tea. I sat alone with feelings that I hadn't felt in years. I looked around at Christmas through a thick, hot blur of tears. And the candles and the holly she'd arranged on every shelf, the impossibly good cookies, she still somehow baked herself. But these rich, tactile memories became quite pale and thin when measured by the Christmas my great-aunt kept deep within. Her body halved and nearly spent, but my great-aunt was whole. I saw a Christmas miracle, the triumph of a soul. The triple beat of two feet and a crutch came down the hall. The rattle of the china and the hutch against the wall. She poured two cups. She smiled. And then she handed one to me. And then we settled back and had a cup of Christmas tea. It's 5.14. I wouldn't have as many memories of Christmas as I do. The lights of Michigan Avenue in Chicago, the splendor of Marshall Field's downtown store, a house in Richmond, Virginia called Maymont, a house built in the late 1890s. It's now owned by the city. And every year at this time, they turn it into a Christmas wonderland where they celebrate a traditional Christmas. People volunteer and get dressed up in the attire of the gay 90s. They open the house and you walk through and it's as though the family were actually in their living. And you're just eavesdropping on their Christmas celebration. Out in the yard, there's a Yule log. I didn't even know what a Yule log was. And they serve hot cider and ginger snap cookies. And then there's the National Christmas Tree. Can you imagine the National Christmas Tree? I mean, we're talking about what amounts to a government Christmas tree put up by bureaucrats. Did you ever see it? I remember the year that I did. I don't know why. It just fascinated me. I drove round and round and round the ellipse, just staring at the National Christmas tree. And then there are the lost treasures. The treasures, the treasures of Christmas past that somehow have just disappeared. How can that happen? How can things that were so important just disappear? Those window candles I spoke about earlier, they're gone. The ones that were it was my job to plug them in every night, and I would wait, happy to do my job. I can afford any damn decorations I want to stick in my windows now. All I'd like to have are those candles. They don't make them anymore, not quite the same way. That reindeer sweater, the one that I used to wear to go over and see my good buddy Santa Claus. It was only worn one day a year. It was only worn two or three times before I outgrew it. What happened to that sweater? How could that sweater have disappeared? The Lionel trains that used to run round and round and round the track under the tree. God, how I hope that they're under some boy's tree today. Again, I have no idea what happened to them. How can something that important disappear? And the Lady Schick electric razor. It was lost somehow in a move. <sighs> Christmas is good times. But it sometimes brings disappointments, too. I, um... I'm dead set against exchanging Christmas gifts with my co-workers. I absolutely oppose it. 
And fortunately, I do not work in an organization that forces it on you. There are some places that do that have Pollyannas and things like that. And there's a very good reason for it. The last time I was forced into participating in a Pollyanna, I knew humiliation as I don't think I have ever known before in my life. It was at a radio station in Norfolk, Virginia. I was more or less in between assignments, shall we say, and I was working there part-time. It was an all-news station, and I did overnights on a weekend. A real slap in my face. But nonetheless, I was a member of the staff, and as such, I was put into the Pollyanna pool. And, of course, they didn't wish to, to cause any undue hardship on any of the employees, such as myself, who were only part-time. So there was a limit on how much you could spend, and the limit was $5. And even though it was a number of years ago, $5 still was not very much money. And lo and behold, I drew the name of the station's general manager. What in the hell do you buy the general manager for five bucks, for God's sake? Well, I searched and I searched and I searched and I searched. I'm a sentimental man. Okay, so I'm a grump, but I'm also a very sentimental man, a sentimental grump, if you will. And I found what I thought was an interesting memento. It was six and a half dollars, a dollar and a half over the five dollar limit, but I figured, what the hell, it's Christmas! I didn't really have an extra six and a half bucks, but that's besides the point. I had to get him something. It was an Edison cylinder. Do you know what an Edison cylinder is? Probably not. But surely you have heard of the Edison recording machine, uh, the original phonograph. They didn't have discs. They had cylinders, wax cylinders. And I found an original Edison cylinder. And I thought, well, you know, the guys in radio and that kind of stuff, you know, there's a little connection here. And uh, it's, you know, it's just something you'd put on your bookshelf. You know, it's no big deal, but it's, it's you know, and it's, you know... Old things mean a lot to me, so I bought it. And I even had my wife wrap it so it didn't look like it was wrapped by a spastic five-year-old. And I took it with me to the station Christmas party. The person who was to <clears throat> give me a gift didn't show up at the party. That's okay. What the hell was he going to get me for five bucks anyway? But the gifts were opened right there at the party. And the general manager opened mine. And he looked at it and said, What in the hell's this? And other people looked at it and said, God, that's weird. Who gave you that? Fortunately, we did not put our names on the gifts. I remember standing there feeling all oh, about as big as, uh, yeah. To this day, I will not exchange gifts with the people I work with. Ain't no SOB going to stand there and say, what in the hell is this? What somebody gave me this for? There was another time that I attended a church bazaar, a Christmas church bazaar, the St. John's Church Bazaar in Collingswood, New Jersey. I'm not really sure how old I was. Pretty young. Eight, nine, ten, possibly. Probably no older. And they had a table of pre-wrapped Christmas gifts. And there was a table for Christmas gifts for Mom. And there was a table for Christmas gifts for Dad. And they were like a buck, buck and a half. Very reasonably priced. And so I purchased one. Having no idea what was inside it. Didn't make any difference. And on Christmas, I presented it to my mother. Unfortunately, either there was some type of terrible mix-up or someone had a warped sense of humor because my mother unwrapped the gift to find a lovely necktie such as life sometimes Christmas brings disappointments Christmas brings so many traditions to keep too like watching It's a Wonderful Life I don't know why I watch the stupid movie okay and I sit there with tears in my eyes wishing hoping against hope that it, it really is true that people really are that good but maybe there really is a guardian angel waiting out there to bail me out of the mess. And the miracle on 34th Street. I still sit there rooting for Chris Kringle. Not all that sure that he's going to win out. And then at the end, when the little 
little girl finds the house. And Chris's cane inside rips me to shreds. It's all I ever wanted when I was a kid, too. It took me 49 years to get it. I'm still looking for the damn cane. It's got to be there somewhere. How else could I have pulled that off? And a Christmas carol. It doesn't really make much difference which version of it it is. I don't even care if it's the Disney Mickey Mouse Christmas carol. I love this story. I rejoice when Scrooge finally comes around and finally celebrates Christmas. You know, I miss the hell out of those old Andy Williams Christmas shows. Uh, probably a lot of you are way too young to remember them. And that silly bear, one that was always trying to get the cookies. I'd still watch it if it was on. And I miss walking down to the pond in Knights Park on Christmas Day to watch the kids trying out their new ice skates. We rarely had snow, but it was almost always cold enough for there to be a, a good coating of ice on the pond. I couldn't ice skate. Didn't want to ice skate. But even as a kid myself, it was something special, like going down there and watching the kids on their new ice skates. And the dads and the moms and everybody trying to teach them how to stay up. And there's so very many special songs. Songs that ought to be played more than just a couple of times a year. Silver Bells. The Carol of the Bells. I'll be home for Christmas. Silent night. God rest you, merry gentlemen. And of course, oh, holy night. The Christmas story is a beautiful one. The Savior. Born in a manger. I wish that I could believe it. I wish that I could believe as so many of you do. But even though I don't, I appreciate it. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful tradition. And one that is marked even in my house. Yes, there's a nativity set in my house. Does that surprise you? Why should it? It's all part of Christmas. It's 528.
And, of course, she will be holding her breath, hoping that the potato salad is to my liking. Of course it will be. My dad will be there, too, hoping that there are no duplicate presents this year. And he'll be working on that, that train, that little miniature garden. Grandma and Jaji will be there. She'll spend most of her time out in the kitchen, overseeing the tiniest detail. And Jaji, in his Sunday best suit, will settle into a, an easy chair. He won't say much. He'll just sit there beaming with pride, presiding over it all. This is the first Christmas in the new house. You know, I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised if if he went over the new house with a fine tooth comb, checking for this and checking for that, making sure that the, the joints and the corners are properly mitered, asking questions like, how much did this cost? Huh. I could have built it for half of that. And somewhere in Kate's gravy will look just awful. It did every year. Oh, I'm telling you, this gravy, oh, it was enough. Just a look at this stuff would make you puke, but... If you closed your eyes and tasted it, taste better than ever this year, I'm sure. And Uncle Franny will carve the bird with skill beyond belief. I think of him every time I attempt to butcher one. And the kids will probably let me play with her toys. Aunt Marie and Uncle Joe will stop by. She'll be just as loud as ever, but she's got a good heart. Uncle Joe will probably have a beer or two more than he should, and Aunt Marie will probably holler at him for it, but They're good people. And it wouldn't be Christmas without them. And somewhere, somewhere some other kid will get a new bicycle this year. Maybe an English racer. We'll both go for that first ride on it all over again. And some other kid will get a new hook and ladder fire truck and we'll both get down on the floor and dream of roaring off to save the day. Somewhere a kid will get a baseball bat, and I'll help him count every day till spring. Some other kid will get a big stuffed animal. I'll hug it right along with him. The kids still get things like red wagons and scooters and Lincoln logs and Boy Scout knives. God, I hope so. Do you suppose that they pay extra special attention to each and every detail so that this Christmas will last forever? God, how I hope they do. Putting up with the crowded stores and the long lines and all of the other hassles of Christmas is behind me now. That's all taken care of. And it's all just a small price to pay anyway. If the gifts I've selected will bring a smile to Mary's face. If what happens tomorrow night will add to her memories. And then almost as soon as it begins, it will be over. The brightly colored wrapping paper will be in the trash, and many of the presents will be put away. There will be sighs of relief that now life can get back to normal. I don't know why we feel relief that life can get back to normal. It's been a great couple of weeks. A couple of weeks of anticipation, a couple of weeks of excitement. And in a week or so from now, the trees will start to come down. They'll start to show up out of the curb. The outdoor lights will slowly disappear for yet another year. Within a month, all signs of the holiday will be gone. Christmas memories will be filed away until next December. And who knows what that will bring. In all honesty, there will never be another Christmas for me like the one I woke to find the miniature garden under the tree the first time, or the one that found that shiny new English racer waiting for me. Such Christmases belong to other little boys now. They should. Time and events have taken their toll on me. The years have conspired to, to alter my views of the day. It's not either Christmas is not for giving. At a time for remembering. Remembering people and places, events, even things. Things that have brought me to where I am today me to get to wherever it is that I may find myself tomorrow. Oh, here we go. 
Carol Wallady in Chicago. I was racing around like a madman in a mall. 900 North Michigan Avenue, I believe. I was doing some last-minute shopping, and quite unexpectedly, I came upon an old friend. He was doing what he does best. He was sitting in a big chair. He was dressed all in red with white fur trim. He was listening to dreams and giving little people hope. And on his knees sat a beautiful little girl. She was telling Santa what she wanted for Christmas. I paused for just a brief moment. And then it happened. He looked up. He saw me. He smiled and nodded. After all these years, he still remembered me. I wonder if that little girl who was sitting on Santa's lap will remember years from now the exchange between that jolly old elf and the middle-aged man in a hurry. The exchange that brought a smile to the man's face. Two old friends who don't get to see each other as often as they'd like to these days. But who still remember each other. I wonder if the person who will spend the night in the Midtown Manhattan YMCA will come away with it. Realizing that it, it's all just a learning experience. The next Christmas will be different. Sometimes I fantasize about having a gift to deliver to whoever is staying in that room on Christmas Eve. <sighs> I haven't gotten around to it yet, but I fantasize about it. I wonder if they'll play silver bells on the carol on this year at the hotel. And if that will become part of someone else's lifelong memory. I wonder. But most of all, I wonder why it is that we spend only a few days a year having feelings like these. It's 541. It's all true. They're all going to be there. All the Christmases from the past, all the people from the past. I wouldn't be surprised that even as I speak, if my grandmother is there in the kitchen putting the finishing touches on things, she and my mother have put aside their differences for the big event. They usually manage to every year. Jaji is probably putting on one of those two suits that he owns. I don't know if I'll wear the chocolate brown one or the pearl gray one this year. But he'll be impatiently waiting to preside over it all. And my dad is probably already on his hands and knees frantically trying to get that train set complete. My mom is probably getting ready to icing, to put the icing on the birthday cake. You know, out in the kitchen, I'll bet there's a boy who looks remarkably like a younger version of me practicing for his solo on Oh Holy Night just one more time. I mean, after all, he is going to sing it at the big one, the 9 a.m. mass. And somewhere, somewhere Grandpa Welsh is... Out there passing out pamphlets, extolling the faithful to please keep Christ in Christmas. While the rest of the family gathers around the tree, eager to open the brightly wrapped presents. Each of us celebrates in our own way, I guess. The turkey will be just as plump and just as delicious as ever. Maybe a little bit more. I, of course, will get a drumstick. I always do. So maybe every present won't be perfect. But how can one reject that which was selected and given with so much love? And as always, I'm going to hold my breath, hoping that the gifts I've given will please. I'm playing a silly little game this year. The, uh, <clears throat> the big one isn't even under the tree. 
hands hidden up on the mantel, please. And all the garland. Don't make her sweat. <laughs> the house is near spotless. The refrigerator is overflowing with food. There's still one more present to wrap. I'll do that tonight when I get home. And when all that's taken care of, we'll all gather together again for the best Christmas ever. Around the prettiest tree ever, we'll feast on the best meal ever. Everybody who has ever touched my life at this time of the year will be there with me. In spirit. It will be the best Christmas ever because each and every Christmas of the past is part of this one. That's the nice thing about it. That's the magic thing about Christmas. It's cumulative. One adds to the next on and on and on. And even more importantly than that, mine are part of yours and yours are part of mine. Of course, I am going to hold out that special gift for Mary until the very last. I won't even... Well, well. God, I hope she likes it. I didn't get my mom anything this year. But we'll reopen all the gifts from the years gone by. One by one. The fancy decanter set, the sailing ship rigging chart, the winter coat that was too big, the gaudy rhinestone necklace and bracelet. You know, when I went up north to clean out her apartment, they were all still there. The warehouse of Christmas presents from the past. All of them. Still there. I don't think she ever threw any of them out. It is my fervent hope that by telling you all of this, by sharing so many past, the good ones, the bad ones, the funny ones, the sad ones, that will not only help you to bring back memories, but will help in making new memories for you, help you to appreciate and treasure the events that have taken place and are just about to. It's very important. Pay attention. Pay particular attention to everything that happens in the next 48, 72 or so hours. Because soon it will all be over. And your memories are all that you'll have left. Don't let any of them get away. Not one. It's not over yet. Hmm? I'm going to cling to every single second to every memory secure the knowledge that something will happen over the next couple of days that will become a treasured memory as soon as next year merry christmas everybody <laughs>